From Embark's headquarters in Dallas, Texas, this is Accounting Matters, an accounting podcast powered by Embark. Hi, hello, good afternoon. It's great to be with each of you. I'm Zach Smith, Embark's East Region Market President, and I'm joined with my co-host, Adam Olson, Embark's Accounting Advisory Practice Leader. On this week's episode, we're here with Mac Martinez, a director in our accounting advisory practice, to discuss the transition many startup companies have to tackle in their life cycle, making the transition from cash to accrual basis accounting. Adam, Mac, it's nice to be with both of you. Good to be here. Yeah, likewise. Always a pleasure, (laughs) never a chore. Adam, today we're diving into the transition from cash to accrual basis from Uh, accounting. This is a big transition for most companies as they mature in their company life cycle. Mm -hmm. Let's start with defining exactly what cash basis and accrual basis accounting is. Yeah, so cash basis accounting, you know, like you said in your introduction, it's um, it's an accounting method that's widely used by generally new startup companies, smaller businesses, um, obviously private companies. Um, in which they more or less account for things as the cash moves in and out. So they don't recognize their revenue until they actually get paid, and then they don't actually recognize um, any expenses that they incur until they pay their expenses. So it's really kind of follows the cash flows of the business for whether or not they recognize revenue or expenses. Um, accrual basis of accounting, on the other hand, which is more like widely used, obviously, and it's the kind of the the foundation of any type of gap accounting. So US gap, IFRS is all under an accrual basis of accounting. Um, That more or less is gonna follow, you know, recognizing revenues and expenses when they're either earned or incurred. So a different premise there that you have to think about. And obviously with newer startup companies, you know, there's a a time and place where it, it makes sense for them to start thinking through is this cash basis of accounting where I need to stay. Yeah, so Adam, talk to me a little bit about why a company would need to convert from cash basis to accrual basis. Are there pros and cons that we need to be thinking about? Uh, Is one more accurate than the other? Yeah, so, you know, there can be a lot of driving factors for what may cause a company to like reevaluate their their basis of accounting. And so, these could be both internal things that they want to accomplish, which they can't under cash basis of accounting. So accrual seems more advantageous, but it could also be external factors that come into play. And and just generally as companies evolve and grow and become more mature in their life cycle, like it almost inherently becomes um, a necessity to make that transition at some point. I mean, I will say that the reason most startup companies begin with cash basis is because it's so simple, right? It's um, it, there's not a cash lot of judgment, in, not a lot out. of com- exactly, not yep. a lot of complexity of theirs, but it, it it does provide you know maybe at that stage of the uh, the company's you know life cycle, like we said, just knowing those cash flows and monitoring those cash flows is sufficient enough for the business at that point. But those needs do change as the company evolves. Yeah, of course. So, okay, cash basis accounting, pretty simple, about as simple as it gets, actually. And there's definitely a certain time and place from when companies should be using that method. But talk, talk to me some about the downsides for using a cash basis of accounting versus the accrual basis. Yeah, so there's... You know, because you're only looking at cash inflows and outflows, like, you know, there's a, there's a, I guess a premise out there that you could kind of abuse when you should be recognizing revenue, not recognizing expenses. So you could be pushing things through to different periods. It's a little less, a little less strict than accrual accounting there. And then just from like an, you know, making like, I guess, decision-making usefulness of your financial information. Um, cash basis accounting, like I said, it, it's focused on those cash flows, um, but it, it does short side some of the visibility into other things that are going on with the business. And what I mean by that is like if you're on a cash basis um, of accounting, you, you generally don't have insight into, for example, like past due payments or when you need to pay a vendor, you got a payment upcoming because you're not accruing for anything. So it literally is just showing you where the cash is going in the business. and so those limitations can also be a disadvantage. Um, And like I said, as you mature and you need to evolve your reporting and your, you know, 
decision making information that's generally when you see people look to accrual basis of accounting is like okay now is the time that we need to actually start um, applying this methodology instead. So Adam, you know, as companies mature and in many cases their financial needs, financial reporting needs continue to grow, talk to me about what events or circumstances might drive that in a company's life cycle. Yeah, so like, you know, one big thing is, um, you know, you, you might need to have financial statements that are prepared under US GAAP, and this could be, you know, there's an external need for them. You know, you need to get an audit firm in. They're going to want to audit your financial statements under kind of an accrual basis, so US GAAP, IFRS. And there, there's different events that can lead to like needing to produce financial reporting um, kind of in that sense. And so some of the more common ones you hear, and this is true to the life cycle of startup companies, is like as they grow, there can be a need to raise additional capital. Um, so bringing in outside investors to help continue and fund the growth of the business, um, or maybe they need to issue some debt um, in order to support that growth. So working with certain lenders, you know, they may require, you know, as part of taking out a, the financing that you know, they want you to submit regular, you know, audited financial statements on an annual basis or, you know, quarterly to provide financial information. And so that's that could just be you know, a, a simple requirement is just part of the covenants of that arrangement. And so you have to have like those financial statements ready to go. So the transition's forced there. And then, you know, similarly, you could have, you know, be looking to bring in an outside investor. So, you know, think about like a private equity firm, maybe looking to get investment from them. Well, almost always they're going to require some level of <laughs> more sufficient, more, uh, not sufficient isn't the word, I guess. Um, robust. Robust. Yeah. Um, complete uh, financial reporting. And so it's going to be a cruel based you Back know, of financial state. Yeah, 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 exactly. If you <laughs> yeah. want to pull in the right investors, so they're, they're going to want to see audited financials as well so they can understand what they're putting their money towards. Um, and then, you know, other situations maybe not as common for, for startup businesses to go from um, where they're using cash basis, but, you know, maybe there is a rapidly growing startup business or, you know, it's, it's unique and there's an appetite in the public markets. You could actually have a, a hyper growth startup that essentially goes directly to an IPO. And so obviously as filing your registration statement with the SEC, you have to have uh, U.S. GAAP or IFRS compliant financial statements, and again, those are audited under PCOV standards. So um, that could be another circumstance. And then the the last one we don't, you know, maybe doesn't come up in, as often, at least for us here at Embark. But uh, from a tax perspective, so a lot of people do cash basis accounting because it's kind of the the premise for sometimes filing your your certain tax filings. Well. There becomes a point under IRS regulations too where you become so large of a business that um, you no longer can use kind of a cash method of reporting your your tax taxable filings, and so at that kind of you know fork in the road juxtaposition of when you need to make that switch, um, you know, accrual accounting could also just be needed for tax purposes too. Okay. Super helpful. Matt, going to switch back over to you. What are some of the major areas of concern when considering the transition from cash to accrual? Anything that our listeners need to be aware of? Yeah, for sure. Um, so really the main objective in making this switch is to resolve um, differences in accounting records between uh, you know, timing of actual cash payments and receipts versus when the actual exchange of goods and services for those cash receipts uh, occurred. Um, so you need, to, you need to get in line with what's called the magic principle, where you match income and expenses um, within the same period in which, they're, which they occur. Uh, so really like completeness and cutoff principles become like a major player. You're here. taking me back to my Florida State <laughs> Accounting 101 days, go Seminoles, uh, for the matching principles. Makes me smile, so I love it. Uh, well, you can take it from here then. So. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm, I'm the pro. Yeah, that's a scary thought. Um, you know, hey, Mac, are there any specific steps to take when making that transition at a high level? I think our, you know, as our listeners are, are listening to this, you know, what are some of the things that they need to be doing? Uh, as they're trying to move from cash to accrual? Yeah, so there's really six broad steps um, when you think about the transition 
within each of these steps, um, there's more considerations kind of taken into account at each, at each stop. But um, in general, the six steps are, uh, you know, you would add your accrued expenses, add prepaid exp expenses, add accounts receivable, and then in turn, subtract your cash payments, subtract cash receipts, and then subtract your customer prepayments or, or deposits that you may have received. Okay, so super helpful there. Let's talk a little bit more then about the specific areas or accounts where further consideration should be highlighted. You know, the way that I'm thinking about it is, what does a company need to do when making the transition um, as it relates to revenue, revenue recognition, those things? Sure. Uh, so like we talked about earlier, under cash basis of accounting, revenue is recorded you know, upon the receipt of cash. Uh, under accrual basis, revenue should really be uh, recorded once it's earned, um, not when cash is received. So, you know, think about an example, like say you perform a service in December, but you, uh, receive cash for that service, uh, in January, right? Under cash basis, you probably, or you wouldn't record that revenue until cash is received in January. However, you know, under accrual basis, you need to evaluate when the service was actually completed, whenever you should record that revenue, which in this, in this scenario would be in December, not whenever cash was received in January. Um, so take it a step further, uh, you know, preparing financial statements under US GAAP, you have to report revenue in accordance with ASC 606, which is the accounting standard that covers re re uh, recognition of revenue. Um, so, you know, 606 gives guidance on uh, when it should be when revenue should be recorded based on when control of a good or service has been transferred or performed. Um, in conjunction with this, it also provides guidance on contract assets or contract liabilities that may need to be recorded um, in conjunction with revenue. Uh, so you may be wondering what, what I'm talking about, contract assets, contract liabilities. Think about getting paid up front for a service um, before you perform it or before it's transferred to the customer, sounds, right? Sounds great. Right, Would love exactly. To have that. Um, but under 606, you're not permitted to record that revenue until the service has been performed or the good has been transferred. Yep. Um, so think of it more of like an example, an airline, right? You prepay an airline when you book a flight, right? Okay. Under cash basis, that airline may record that or would record that revenue whenever cash is received. Under accrual basis of accounting, the airline wouldn't be permitted to record that revenue until it had provided the service or completed the flight. So whenever the airline receives that cash, they would record um, deferred revenue on their balance sheet as a liability. Whenever the service is performed, they can relieve that liability and record the revenue. You can think of correcting your accrual-based revenue balances by following the, these specific steps for revenue. Um, you would start with the cash receipts for the current period, subtract beginning AR, add your ending accounts receivable, add beginning unearned revenue, and then subtract your ending unearned revenue. Okay, so let's hit the other side then uh, from the income statement expenses. Talk to me about getting those all shored up. Sure, so once you've kind of got your revenue lined up, uh, you need to make sure your expenses are recorded appropriately. Kind of similar principle when they're incurred in line with the, in, in line with the matching principle. Um, so, you know, a lot of times companies will record their expense just when cash goes out, not when they're incurred. So take for example, like payroll, right? A lot of times companies pay their payroll in arrears. So using the December, January example again, um, company may be paying their employees in January for time that was worked in December, right? Um, so the expense related to this payroll would need to get accrued in December as a liability on the balance sheet. And then in turn, that liability would get relieved whenever it's paid in January. Um, so as we talked about in the six steps, accruing for expenses when they're incurred um, instead of when they're paid is, is really critical in, in this transition. So it, you know, it, it's not limited to payroll. They can, the, these kinds of expenses span across all kinds of items, um, payroll, vacation, other services that may have been performed for your company, but paid at a later date, right? Um, so a common practice is for a company to review their expenses um, at the end of a reporting period or after the end of a reporting period to ensure that they've 
complete or to cover off on completeness basically they've they've accrued for all expenses that they should have accrued for um so similar to revenue you can think of deriving this accrual uh based on the following steps um you know start with cash paid for operating expenses during the period add your beginning prepaid expenses subtract ending prepaid expenses then subtract beginning accrued liabilities, and then finally add your ending accrued liabilities. So Mac, sounds pretty straightforward, but although maybe relatively simple as we're sitting here talking about it, uh, an extremely important principle from making the switch from the cash to accrual, both from a revenue and an income yep. or expense uh, standpoint. So we just talked a little bit about um, adding and subtracting different prepaid balances. Let's talk through the logic of how that fixes the accounting for these expenses under the accrual basis. For sure. So you need to take into account any expenses that you pay up front as well. Um, so think of a prepaid expense as like an insurance policy, policy that may cover off on multiple periods, right? You pay it up front, but that policy covers, say, two years worth of insurance, right? Under cash basis, you would just record the full payment amount as expense when, it's in, when, when you pay it, right? Um, but on the accrual basis, that policy uh, covers two years. So you would take half of the expense in the first period or the first year and then the other half in the second year. Okay, makes sense. So Adam, let's go ahead and switch back over to you. New okay. and updated accounting standards are a part of the profession. Anything that companies should keep in mind here? Yeah, I mean, obviously like getting your books all shored up um, and making that initial transition from cash basis to accrual basis is important. But once you're gonna decide to start reporting under an accrual basis framework, so US GAAP, IFRS, whatever whatever you decide to, to mirror your accrual basis of accounting under, um, you know, you gotta more or less keep up with what changes are being made to that, th those frameworks, that guidance. And so, you know, that includes looking at, you know, maybe discrete changes that the different, you know, standard setting bodies, so the FASB, for example, are putting forth, um, or there could even be more broad implications from, you know, major standards that they put through. So most recently, you know, a lot of, you know, accrual based companies that, you know, report under US GAAP, they've been, they've gone through the exercise of ASC 606, like we've talked about mm -hmm. as it relates to revenue recognition. Um, a lot of people have completed the big, you know, lease guidance transition from the old leasing standard to the new leasing standard. Um, same with the credit law standards. Like these are just examples of three major standards that impacted nearly every reporting entity in some capacity um, or will impact a reporting entity in some capacity. So these are just other areas that um, companies that are making this transition also need to kind of keep in mind is that. There is some due diligence just to stay up with, you know, as um, standard updates are issued, as things are changed, yes, just to be following what 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 is changing, what's trending, is it applicable to your business, and how that might change um, the way you're accounting for things or just processes and procedures in general. It's uh, uh, it's it's part of the the mat the maturity, the maturation of the company, just kind of growing up that you have to follow those things a bit more. Yeah, we know a little bit about that here at Embark, and I know that we here from a podcast standpoint have touched on 606, 842, and 326 yep. uh, rulings and, and released some information on those. And then um, we also, I know as a practice line leader, you see a lot of engagements that our consultants touch yep. um, on a day in and day out basis, all related to uh, each of those topics. So great points here. Let's talk a little bit about the operational side. What challenges exist for companies making this shift? I would think that logistically or operationally, um, the accrual basis is going to be more extensive, more time consuming, more involved yep. for all of their accounting professionals. No. Things that we need to consider there. <laughs> no, you're exactly right. Um, you know, making that transition is clearly going to change the way the company has to go about obviously aggregating all of their information to prepare their financial reporting. And it's going to, it's going to create the the necessity to like, just like I said, look at their existing processes, procedures, policies, um, and revamp a lot of those. I think what, what becomes challenging for a lot of organizations, especially since we talked about these are generally newer companies, smaller companies, they may have very lean accounting teams or finance teams. Um, and so, 
they may be playing multiple roles, doing lots of different things. You know, there's a bigger investment and time commitment to, to, uh, report under an accrual basis of accounting. There's more things that need to be done at each reporting period close. Um, so things like that to keep in mind. And then even just from like a technology perspective too. So, you know, depending on your business and the investments you made, I mean, a lot of like cash basis systems or technology tools may not be able to fully just, you know, transition easily to an accrual basis of accounting. Uh, maybe you were using things as simplistic as Excel spreadsheets or something else that's a little more like rudimentary. And so I would just, you know, you, you got to think about, is it as you make this transition, are there also other investments that the company maybe would need to make um, to allow them to, you know, report under an accrual basis of accounting and to do it, obviously, you know, from an accuracy standpoint and completeness standpoint, but also just from like a timeliness standpoint, just because the accounting close cycle is going to be more, uh, more, more involvement from your team is going to require more commitment, more resources. Um, and so, you know, a lot of companies think have to be prepared for that. Or if you're not, then just thinking about bringing in outside advisors or people to help you as you navigate that initial transition and kind of get your team up to speed over time to eventually take that over, but maybe not just kind of throw it at them and hope for the best is maybe not the <laughs> the most productive way to go about it. Yeah. So, that, I mean, again, this is, this is an undertaking. And so organizations need to really understand exactly the cost and implications for making this switch, mm -hmm. uh, both from a human capital standpoint, but also from a dollar outlay perspective. Yeah. For and, audit, and, and, and we've talked about like one of the big catalysts for this transition is you need audited financials. And so obviously even just going through an audit, and then we did a, a conversation around first year audit. Yeah. So would definitely recommend uh, people listen to that too. But that that's just, again, another hurdle that like companies making the transition are also going to have to prepare for and requires a lot of resources and effort and things around too. So of course. Um, just, just one more, more, more thing to throw in the hat. <laughs> yeah. So lots of things there, but also a very exciting time for organizations as they go through this, mm -hmm, because it sure. means continued growth and maturity, right. which is always exciting. Exactly. Mac, I want to uh, switch back over to you and I want to end on a high note in helping clients navigate making this transition. What are some of the best practices that maybe you've observed over the course of your career or things that we see here, uh, typically at Embark? Yeah, for sure. So a, a lot of companies who, who may be navigating this transition or using uh, accounting softwares that may not be super uh, accrual basis friendly. They're probably more designed to be used in cash basis. Um, so a lot of the entries that you may have to do to close the reporting period to get a, to get uh, from cash basis to accrual basis are probably going to have to be done manually. Um, so to set, set yourself up for success, um, you know, it's really imperative to put together kind of a listing of policies and procedures that need to be done um, at each reporting period as kind of like a closed checklist, right? Uh, to track these tasks and journal entries uh, to move from cash to accrual, get the books closed. Um, a lot of times these checklists are just tracked simply in Excel, um, but there's even applications out there these days that, that help track these checklists, you know, more technology efficiently, I guess. Um, Another item that would really help uh, help out in this process is to make sure you have a robust but efficient chart of accounts. Um, so a chart of accounts is a map of all your financial accounts in the GL, um, in the general ledger. Um, it can really help with organization. Um, and then, you know, for those using accounting software, uh, there's generally a, a pre-populated chart, chart of accounts, but you can go through and kind of tailor it to be more fit for what the reporting, uh, reporting entity needs. Um, and then just from an efficiency perspective, um, outside of the checklist, just to the best of your, of your team's ability, you know, setting up templates, um, for account reconciliations to track these accruals, um, entries such as depreciation and amortization, other things like that. Uh, it's just going to make your life easier as you kind of get up against the, you know, into the reporting period, whenever you need to make this transition from cash to accrual on a monthly basis. 
Yeah, listen, I, I think this is an exciting time for any organization to have to go through this. Although it is a hurdle requiring some steps and things, hoops to jump through, uh, it just means that the organization just continues to grow. And I think that's always exciting. Listen, Mac, always a pleasure having you here. It's been a while since you've been on our show. Yeah, so has. welcome back and thanks again for joining us. Adam, always a pleasure. So thank you again for sharing all sure. of your insight here. To our listeners, thanks so much for tuning in to uh, this week's episode of Accounting Matters, powered by Embark.